morning it is racing tv which can mean only one thing it is luck on sunday time excellent guests and lively debate over the next two and a half hours i'm here's what's coming your way i'll be talking to kieran that's kieran with a c young kieran fallon joins us the rising star of the weighing room about what's been a fantastic season so far and it could get better and from young to the more but 40 years with the champion trainer we'll reflect on what's been a brilliant action all round, in particular on Friday night at the Curra, where this horse, Siskin, gave Jair Lyons. Trainer Jim Boyle is in the studio, reflecting on his season and talking about what he expects for the rest of the year. Jim Boyle in the studio. And recently retired jockey Emma Sayer is in as well. What a night it was at Carlisle for Team Sayer. Emma, who... First up in the hot seat alongside me is a man whose name comes steeped... Fallon Jr., which is what you call yourself on Twitter. But then that feels not quite right because, of course, your, your first names are spelt differently. Yeah, no, look, I put it on uh, Twitter just so it covers all aspects, you know, so no one gets confused and that. So it's just a little thing, isn't it, you know? And just... But we probably thought all the driving was over, but no, he looks after me well, you know. He takes me most to most meetings I ride at and helps me with all the... First time riding at a track, he'll definitely come and walk the track with me, you know, and we'll look at the races and we'll see what the best thing is to do. Obviously, you've got to listen to the instructions, what the trainer gives you, but then, obviously, my dad will give me a little advice and tips about how to ride the track and, um, you know, it's, it's paid off so far. And He'd, he'd want to do if I go and have a chat with him. He was like, yeah, he loves it. I wouldn't have done it. He loves it. <laughs> you, you, you do seem to you do be open to doing this sort of thing, perhaps more so than plenty in the press would have expected your dad to, for example. Yeah, no, obviously... The This is, you know, just to get themselves out there a bit more, and I think it, it, it's very good to, you know get yourself you know seen and shown on the racing stage and I think that is, is paying off for me a bit at the minute so hopefully it can carry on. Well it's paying off for you as well because you're right. at the moment and we've got a good apprentice jockey championship between you and Sean as well. I think we'll come to that but just take me back if you can Kieran for you recent Racing Post article. Um, which was very informative about you. And I think one of the, the main things I was surprised to read about that was... What... But that's not been the case. No, obviously, uh, my mum and dad split up when I was younger, so that brought me up, up to Wigan with my mother, and um, there's nothing about horses up there at all, so I was kind of away, but then obviously I'd watch my dad on TV, and I kind of... And then eventually... One Sunday morning, I just rang my dad and said, look, I want to be a jockey. So then I come down to Newmarket. What, sorry, what was the response to that? He kind of just laughed. He didn't force it upon me or ever speak to me about it. So, um, you know, I gave him a call and I come down and I sat on... Um, Uh, about just over two and a half, two and a half years ago now, I think, 
and then I was sat on the the hack for first few weeks, and then eventually put me on a, a race horse, and you know, um, he looked after me really well, and he, he started me off easy, put me on nice easy rides, and then. Mr. Haggis, you know, he's he's looked after me so well and I can't thank him enough for everything he's done for me the you know, these three years. Um actually got me to the the stage I'm at now. He's got me to you know, gaining confidence because I think it's a confidence thing as well as and I think if you start off and you're falling off, I think you get knocked and you don't really want to do it. But he looked after me and put me on the nicer horses and then he's just progressed me through there. I mean they able to in, in three years really from from going to to the racing school to riding in a yard like William Haggis is to now challenging from an, an apprentice a natural sort of connection with the horse initially no yeah it, it's funny because like I have when I sit on a horse I just find myself comfortable and I just I don't get a feeling I do when I sit on a horse like when I used to play football and rugby I used to get such an adrenaline and I, and I did love it but not, not not a feeling I get when I sit on a horse it's I don't know it's strange but I get some in a good connection with the horse for the 30 seconds you have before you actually race ride and I think if you you know build that connection with the horse before the race I think that you know you can just get a little bit more out of them as a a 16 year old guy when when horse racing wasn't how old are you now Kieran at 20 so so just before perhaps you make that that decision to that you want to go and be a jockey what were the other options you're quite a keen sportsman Academies. I went. I went to college, and you know, I used to run for North Wales, and you know, it was always something to do with sport. I knew I was going to go down the sporting route. We're here today. Did you feel a bit of pressure at the racing school? Because I can imagine lots of people your age are in there, but perhaps sure comes a, a little bit of pressure, a little bit of um, added added weight on your shoulders, perhaps, whether you feel it or not, I don't know, but people looking at you... ...brown horses, this is as new for me as it is for you. No, I think because when I wasn't in the racing, you know, world type of thing, I was just an outsider, and I didn't actually realise how good my dad was because I was just watching the racing as it was, and I know he, he rode a few winners, I didn't see him. Did, yeah. I didn't see him as as good as he was. So when I went to the racing school, I just known him as another jockey. So he actually was, but I still don't find any pressure because, like I said before, when I sit on the horse, I just just connect with the horse. It's just me and the horse, and I just get on with my job. So is it something? You can actually go back and watch and, and perhaps learn and understand exactly what he was doing at a certain time. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I must have watched all these rides on YouTube a thousand times, you know, especially at Epsom. The first ever time I rode at Epsom, I must have watched that clip when I left home to the track, you know, and I, I get some buzz just watching it because when I finally rode at Epsom, I could actually understand the... As soon as when I rode a winner, I, I kind of I got my two phones and I kind of watched and tried to, you know, see the similarities. But no, it's some feeling there. Yeah. Um, when you, if you allow yourself to to think ahead, I don't know if you do because it's all come around quite quickly for you. But to 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 be champion jockey and those sort of things in your mind, or are you just taking it? a day as it comes or a year and still sort of finding your feet in the industry yeah look I think um, you know in the position I am in now um, I don't see why I can't go
was to try and ride all the racetracks, learn all the racetracks and ride for every all the different trainers, meet owners and just build on connections, you know, for the following years in the future because I feel like it's yeah, it's all good going for champion apprentice, but I've only been and then you know for next year then you can you can kind of see where you're at and um, but no we're in a position I've ridden for a lot of trainers owners built a lot of connections and um, you know I've read a few winners this season and hopefully it continues been a, a different start to the season for you there was a, a lot of talk of, uh, at the start of the season about Sean being a likely winner of the apprentice title and perhaps it wasn't having only ridden a few winners for you coming into this year on your agenda as much as it was for him but it, it seems to have developed quite quickly at what point did it become a, perhaps a decision where you and your few doubles and then it just put me it put me just one behind him and we kinda had a look at things, you know, and, and seeing how so, you know, we spoke to Mr. Haggis and, you know, uh, my agent and we kinda just discussed things and just said, Look, we'll take it as it comes. Riding uh, at uh, Glorious Goodwood, you know, especially riding the winner there, you know, that has been a real highlight for me this year. For Saeed? And, yeah, Saeed, and obviously riding at Royal Ascot, you know, on Raucus, um, and then again at Glorious Goodwood on Raucus. You know, he, he's been a real good horse to me this year. What I, the, was it the, it was the last race of the Category yeah. Festival you won, wasn't it? Yeah. For, for Saeed. What's that? I mean, is, is that another pinch yourself moment where you go, God, how's the, this season? Here I am at, at, at Glorious Goodwood riding a winner. You know, again, at the start of this season, could you have ever felt that was a, that was likely on your agenda? No, definitely not. You know, I was, uh, I was very lucky to get a ride, um, you know, and it's all coming quite quick, but, you know, I'm taking everything in and, you know, we're doing everything and hopefully we can keep getting these rides and uh, long may it continue. Did you expect to win? Um it was it was a hard one, you know. There's there, there was a lot of good horses in it, and it's it, apprentice races. They're always quite a bit messy with big fields like that, and it's not back to ride, you know. Um, and we were slow away, and it put me into a position where I didn't really want to be. But I was kind of happy when they went off at such a good gallop, you know. I kind of sat in and got the horse to relax and find his stride. And when we come, the horses they 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 were, they were they, I knew they were going quite quick because I, I went to Australia I learnt my times and I knew I was comfortable and my horse was comfortable in the, in the way that he was travelling and you know I just let him free roll down the hill and I just picked him up and he he went away and he he won the race pretty well. Fist pumping no 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 arm waving or anything no. at the end it was quite cool and calm yeah. and collected at the end. Yeah no just pat the horse you know it's just yeah just one of them I don't know I don't. You don't, you don't, no. you don't give it large when you no, cross the line. No, definitely not. No, Look, my my dad never did it either. So, I... have you? I mean, just talking to you out there, we were, we were talking about the Arlington Million and, and about Magic Wand who finished second in there, and, and you, you were there. You were saying, well, you know, she won this, she won that, and I was thinking, oh, that's right, you know. So, but your your knowledge seems to be, I suppose, something you've amassed in because, as you say, growing up as a as a teenager, perhaps it wasn't massively on your agenda. I mean, have you have you almost become a, a horse racing bookworm in the last few years and just got stuck into form, or, or was it something you were following on and off throughout your your, your teenage years? Yeah, no, look, I never looked into it. Um, but obviously, when you you come in and I'm apprentice now, I, I have to you know know my form, and um, you know I don't just sit there and read a book and just you know study all I, I I study my form races and then I'll just take little bits and pieces and obviously you watch all the big learning your form and the breeding just comes and I think it, it'll come in time we, we're slowly learning obviously I've got my dad to help me um, and I'm just trying to picking up little things and bobs and hopefully you know we can start putting the finger on everything and getting a lot of things right. Speaking to and senior if you like at Haydock and you know he he did make that point to to me saying that he he wouldn't ever go and tell you exactly what to do, but when it comes to the different tracks, that it's important for you to be aware of where you might want to be and, and how to ride them. So is there a... 
exactly what he'll pass on, if you like, because he, he wants to let you find your feet in your own way. Yeah, he, he knows as well you've got to do what the trainer asks you to do. And obviously, if the trainer, if you ride a horse that has to be held up and it's a front range track, you have to do that. But he'll just tell me for future. Know, and he'll just tell me the best way to ride the tracks and he'll tell me if there's any undulations or where you want to be holding, kicking, sitting, if you want to be following a horse or not. So I think it all depends on the day and how the race looks on paper. On paper and he knows that, so he never, you know, tells me exactly what to do. He'll just tell, give me pointers because if you think that the horse is going to make the running and you think it's going to be going a good strong gallop and it misses the break and it doesn't pan out like that, you know, so there's there's lots of different things you know and when you do get told instructions. So he just gives me pointers about the track and then he lets the, the trainer give me the instructions and I'll do my best to, to ride to the instructions I get given. And for all your fundamental similarities, there are I think everyone appreciate and it came across in the in the post is between between the two of you in, in in perhaps the, the young versions of yourself and, and the, 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 the troubles which your dad was open about in his book. I don't want him next door, I don't want him to come in and hurl something at me. But, you know, the, 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 the difficulties that I think he, he faced on many aspects, um, however brilliant he, he was in it. And, and, and you yourself, are you, are you aware of that? Is that something you, you, you almost want to avoid going through your career and, and you want to, you know, stay healthy? And, and, and I don't know if there's a party element to what you do, but a different way given what your, your dad experienced perhaps the, the the harsh realities of horse racing yeah no like I, I, I've understood and I've, I, I've seen and I've been told of all what's been happened and you know I've been very lucky to be brought up with such a good family I have and I've been kept away from it all um, but you know look I don't drink I don't go out you know I'm I'm a, I'm a family guy you know if I've got any spare time I'll spend it with a family um, I, when I, w I went, to, I was in college and I, d I studied personal training and gym instructions. Instruction freak, fitness freak, you know. So um, I've kept away from all the, the bad side of things. And when I do get the time off, I'm with my family or I'm in the gym. So I think being brought up in Wigan and being being around the family I do have has kept me away from all of that. I think I'm very lucky. And I think I've got a good base um, surrounding me, so I will I won't go down that route. Do you drink? You, no, said, you don't? Never drink. Not even when I was younger, growing up in Wigan, I'd never drink. So, I mean, now, you know, you move to Newmarket, the lads maybe go down one of the, one of the pubs, but you... I mean, you're, you're a teetotaler. Oh, I won't go with them. I don't go to the pubs or anything like that. I'm a, I just stay away completely. And, I mean, is that, is that because of you, you're aware of things growing up that, that other family members had experienced, or is that just something, do you think, in the time that you... As somebody that did a personal training course and, and as somebody that was, you know, going to the gym and, and, and keeping very healthy, do you think it, you just fell into that because of that route you, you went down and the times we're in now, where perhaps alcohol is seen as a bit more of a vice than it was? Yeah, I think so, uh, but more so time to do other things like that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to the pub because I don't, it's not for me. I'd rather spend that time that I've got going playing golf with my dad or spending time with my family or going to the gym, you know? So I think that's more of a mental thing and, you know, I, I, I can't see myself in that route because, you know, it's, you don't have much time with your family. So I like to cherish the time I do have with my family. So if I've got spare time, it'll be with my family or it'll be in the gym. Or be... Who, who wins when you play golf with your dad? Oh. He's not still playing off 16, is he? 14. 14. Still. Bandit. But yeah. now, look, Sometimes I win, sometimes I lose, but it's one of them, isn't it? And, and I suppose, as far as you... you when you, you talk about calling your, your dad about wanting to, to go and be a rider three and a half years ago, whatever it was, what was it like from, from, from Mum's point of view? Because, of course, she, you, know, you, you credit her with, with keeping on the straight and narrow and the fantastic upbringing you've had. You know, was, it, was it ever something that you think she thought that you want to go down? No, look, it was a shock to her when I told her and she didn't want me to become a jockey. Um, but you know she's respected my decision, and you know she's very supportive and caring, and she does her best for me as well. She looks after me pretty well, and you know I can't thank her enough. Bringing into where I am now, she still does a good job, you know, managing me and looking after me well, and making sure I'm on the straight and narrow. What was it like for somebody, you know, from where you grew up, away from the sport, to go into Newmarket because it is is an all-encompassing horse racing town, is it? Was it a bit of a culture shock for you? Yeah, look, it was it's a bit of a shock, but, um, you know, for me, it's just, I just get on the same road every every morning, you know, that 
uh, down to the yard, back again, back to the race. I'm just a little bit out, outside of the town, you know, I'm not too involved with it because, I, you know, I, I've heard stories and I just try and keep away, you know, so I just go to the yard, go home, go to the gym, go home, go to the races, go home, you know, so I kind of keep away out of town, but, you know, it's, it's a very, very good town for the horse riding side, you know, you've got unbelievable trainers, you have got really good people there as well, don't get me wrong, um, but, you know, I just tend to keep myself to myself, I'm just me and my family, and that's kind of all it is, really. You've never, I don't know if now you're, you're, you're lighter than when you were playing all the other sports, yeah. I suppose you'd have to be a little bit, Did you, is that something you had to set your mind to, or has it not really been an issue for you? No, yeah, look, when I when I started uh, Miss Tagus's, and, you know, when I, and I realised I was going to get my licence, I went into the way and I was about nine stone six. Did you have any idea how much he weighed before? No. Do you not? No, I just, it was just a thing. And then obviously I realised the weights and I had to, my right, I went into the weighing room and the valets weighed me, I was nine stone six. And I thought, oh no, I need to proper manage myself on a diet and I gave myself a, a training programme and I got myself down to about eight stone. So, um, gave yourself a training programme? Yeah. You didn't have to have any help with that? No, no, I did it on myself through obviously the, the year I was at college, you know, I, I managed my, um, my weight pretty well stone and you know it's 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 a good weight to be at you know because you can do the light weights without struggling and obviously the heavier weights you just use lead and etc and what's an average day like for you regime wise now beyond you, you go in you every day yeah no so, so i'll go into the gym as much as i possibly can and obviously if i'm riding up north you say i, I wouldn't have the time to and you know if if i don't have the time to I'll, I'll be at home and I'll be doing my obviously press ups, sit ups, etc. I think that the, the the main thing my dad did, you know, push was fitness. So I think with me being a personal trainer and gym instructor, it's actually helped me a lot because it, it is you've got to be so fit, you know, um, especially when you're riding the finish, horse straight and you know keep them going to the line. I think it's very important. What was the hardest thing? race riding wise that, that that you've had to pick up because as we say it's been, it's been a short space of time you, you've had to learn this um what what's the one thing that perhaps and you thought you might it, that's, a, that's a good question actually i've never really thought about that um, you're, you're gonna say you found it easy now aren't you you're gonna get a load of stick from it you might have done no look it, obviously i'm still learning you know and i still do things wrong and you know it's all about how the races are run and being in the right position and I think that you've got to respect your, your riders around you I think that's been you know the, one of the main things I've, I've learned over the last few weeks definitely especially in the bigger races and the bigger handicaps you know you've just got to you've got to be a bit more careful to your, your fellow riders around you and I think that's that's one thing that I've started to you know do learn a lot better now because obviously earlier on, on my career was I got done a few times for careless riding because I wasn't aware you know but now obviously I've been aware now and I think that's been the you know the the biggest attribute to my riding that I have learned you know about the positioning of the races and to be and to respect those around you and yeah. be careful for all there's a bravery element and you know bold rides that we can <laughs> there are others around you and essentially look it's a dangerous sport you're competing in did you ever have a fear aspect you had to deal with no <laughs> No, I, I, I just love going fast and, you know, riding in the finish. I know, I just, I, just, I just love it. I get a buzz out of it. I get the impression talking to you that it would be magic if you won the Apprentice title, but it's, it, 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 it perhaps isn't the be-all and end-all this season because it, it wasn't necessarily on the agenda at the start of the season. Is that fair? Yeah. Without your agent screaming down and saying, <laughs> no, we're going to win it. But, you, you know, it's not, it's not perhaps like... There. No, it's not. Look, um, I, I came into it expecting just to have a few winners, you know, and obviously I just wanted to learn my trade. And then you get into a position where I'm in now and you kind of, not have to, but you just kind of have to keep doing what you're doing because it's working. And, and I have got the most winners, then it, like I said before, it is a bonus. But, you know, I just want to keep learning, learning the tracks, meeting new owners, trainers and building relationships with them. And, you know, the relationship I've built with Miss Haggis over the last year has definitely, uh, definitely got a lot stronger. You know, I'm, I'm happy where I am at the minute and hopefully it continues. And William Haggis will be joining us on the phone uh, to talk about brilliant day he had yesterday, six time and a second out in Arlington as well. For now, Kieran Fallon, thank you very much indeed. Don't go anywhere, you're going to stick around and review some... Uh, 
have um, Maddie Playl in and Jim Boyle will be joining us as well. For now, we're going to enjoy part one of our Corky Brown feature. I went to catch up with him earlier on this week. He has, of course, retired uh, from his time at Seven Barrows, and I sat down with Corky earlier this week. So Corky, here we are, middle of Seven Barrows, place that's been your home for over 40 years. Are you ever actually lived no. on site? That's right, no. isn't it? Lived in the village. So how long has Lambourne, as a village, been home to you, Corky? Ooh, 1963. And a very bad winter. Nearly went. Well, you nearly came over and you nearly called it quits straight away. I nearly, but I couldn't get out of Lambourne. <laughs> <laughs> the frost and snow was that bad. Life might have been quite different had you. Might have been. Might had have you been. gone home. Might have been as good. So how did it come about that you you came? Fred was still going when you when you when, when left. you left there. Well, I served my time in County Meath in, in Ireland, and um, I done five years apprenticeship, which is I was done six actually. Stayed there for six, and Fred went and started up about six months before. So I, I, I decided to come over to him. Because in Ireland it was like three days a week racing. Mm. All we had was five or six days a week. So I, I don't want to get into national hunt anyway. Fred, that, Fred, wasn't Fred it? was a master, a master player. Great, great, great trainer. Uh, you, I learned everything as an apprentice. You had to. You know, from feeding to riding to mucking out to everything. He learned you the whole ropes all the way around. I had to learn sort of quickly because there were strict times and times. What was, what was he like to work for? What, the first trainer. Fred? Uh, Fred was a gentleman, yeah. Never was his voice at all. Good trainer too. Um, Who was the very best for, for, from your time at, at Fred, Corky? Who was the, the one horse that, you, if you can pick out one, that you thought I might be, was I might best. be biased, but I, I looked after that horse myself. And I was Killeney. He, um, he won eight out of eight chases for champion hurdle, really. And he won eight out of eight. He done his uh, shoulder and it Heinz chased at Ascot. You were there? He probably took him, yeah. It was, because he, they, were, they were saying he had been England's article. Mm. He was there since he won, just on the Lions chase, 25 lengths. That's a good, that's a good, good horse, awesome, isn't it? Do you feel like a like a risk because you were, you know, you'd been somewhere so established and then as though he was going to make a huge success of it. He was a, a younger trainer. Did it, did it feel like a risk for both of you starting up together? Well, coming from Fred's to here, as I had led myself, it was going to be hard to live up to. You know, champion hall horses, gold cup horses, sort of great horses. I'd try and sort of get a winner at Cheltenham and prove I was I was trying to prove myself as much as I wanted to do it for him. Well, I'm interested. What you know, you you, you leave a place like like Fred's and and you, you come to to Nick as a young trainer as he was then, and, and still still I suppose something to prove. What led to that move, Corky? Well, Nicky Nicky was assistant at Fred's. I had left Fred's by then, five years. I had left Fred's five years. Nicky was assistant trainer for five years, and. Uh, he decided to go training, and he was looking for the head lad. And surprise, surprise, he knocked on my door. Because Fred always had the best staff in the world. Mm. Any lad could do anything up there. Could you could tell? Write anything. Could you tell Nicky? Going to I mean, not necessarily go and achieve what he has, but could you tell he'd always go on and, and make it as a trainer, given his, given his background, given his time at Fred? Well, I would hope we could make it. The challenge, I knew that. 
But um, once in the morning at church, he said to me, did you take that job from Nicky Anderson? I said, I said, yes, I did actually. You will do it, he said, you will do it. You were always keen, he said, to do something. That was nice coming from Fred. Nice yeah, for you to hear. He was. And another thing, you know, was a big, a big thing for me, when we had the first jump in huddle. See you then. So I knew you'd do it. Mm. That was something coming from Fred. First of three as well. Was. You know, I walked away from like, I forgot I backed the horse. <laughs> I forgot about that. I just thought about Fred said, you know. So I um, went on from there. I read somewhere with See You Then that Nicky always said it was his job to get him ready for the races and it was your job to, to patch him up after. Patch him up, yeah. After the first chop and hold like they were going. The best. It was that bad like. I said, no way. Give him six weeks to settle down and we'll sort it. Anyway, of course, I worked on him for six weeks. I'd have been in a swimming pool in Lamborn. Because we had one that time. I mean, I was freezing, minus five in the morning. Stood up there for an hour and he left to his knee. Morning, noon, and night. It worked. Was that common practice at the time? Or no. Was that something that. It was something I was trying to achieve myself. Years ago, with my, my dad. And he thought sea water was always great for horses' legs. I had to swim with more just a freezy legs. And when at the time you're doing something like that, does anybody look at you and think, obviously you had, you had Nicky's backing? Did anyone. Yeah, yeah they thought I was a lunatic. I'm completely an Irish mad paddy. <laughs> Stood at five o'clock in the morning with a horse and up to his knees in water. <laughs> I was sitting on the side. So, and as you know, he was a bit of a savage at the time. But he was great to work with. And so he was, he was nasty. But he was talented. Talented, really talented. Good horse. Where? Takes an achievement to get three champion holders out of one horse. You know, especially with bad legs. Luck on Sunday, proudly sponsored by our Basti Ecruel Dubai. Dubai, on my way from home. Brrr, Cheltenham, a bit chilly for me. Not that this guy's noticed. Royal Ascot. This is more like it. Voila, perfection. Head to racingbreak.com to find out more. To date with all the latest racing action, do you want exclusive access to breaking news and competitions? Are you looking to connect with fellow racing fans? Look no further. Our social media channels feature everything you love about racing TV and more. Tips. Stay ahead of the game, even when you're on the move, with breaking news, fast results and racing replays. Available on our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube channels. With regular social media competitions, polls and discussions, thousands of like-minded community members every single day. Stay in the know with 24-7 updates, available on your laptop, smartphone or tablet. There's always something happening on the racing TV, social media channels. So follow us today. Luck on Sunday. Proudly sponsored by our Basti Ecruel Dubai. Welcome back to Luck on Sunday. Nearly full time. Video alongside me. Emma Say will be in a little bit later. I'm p pleased to say that Maddie Player of the Racing Post is alongside. Kieran Fallon is still in, and Jim Boyle has joined me as well. Uh, Maddie, how are you? All well? Yeah, all good, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Jim, how's things? Life good? You're, you're off. Today? Yeah, I got one at winter today, so um, be shooting straight from here when we're done. Has Kieran ridden for you before? He as has uh, once. Um, gave the filly a good ride, have to say that, don't I? You have to say that. <laughs> He's no, she, right next to you. She was a bit unlucky, actually. She, 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 she just got... It was a good third, and uh, yeah, yeah no, clearly would be looking to use him again. Um, Kieran 
was was talking about Epsom and the and, and the place and looking back at his dad's wins there and then going and riding there and what that was like. I mean, you're an Epsom trainer. Do you, do you still get that that feeling of the place being steep? In your time there, how long you've been there? I suppose it wears thin to an extent, but I mean, it's a, it's a track you still have great success at, and you obviously still target being your local track. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a couple of factors there. Yes, it is steeped in history. History doesn't sort of pay the bills. Um, so, from a to forget about its history and, and, and make sure we're looking to the future, um, um, and which we're looking to do with our, our yard and you know, knock down, redevelop, and, and build a brand new yard. And Epsom needs that. Needs a um, you know, some new infrastructure there, location and facilities, and everything else are, are superb, second to none. Um, but yeah, we love the buzz around Epsom Derby. Um, it, you know, it puts quite a lot of pressure on us as trainers. That two weeks before the Derby, there's a lot of razzmatazz going on, a lot, a lot of build up on the downs, and we've got to train. Um, you know, it's not tin it's tinged with a little bit of making things more difficult for those two weeks but the whole buzz around the place is superb um and the you know the other meetings we we clearly like to target um and um, we've had a, a good summer there those those evening meetings through july we've had uh, and um you know out the four meetings and yeah it's gone really well where where are you on on epsom as a training establishment i mean it feels as though once a year there is there is something where epsom gets a a bit of a, a bashing if you like as a training establishment in comparison to the to perhaps where Lambert is now. I mean, where do you stand on Epsom as a training establishment? What would you like to see Epsom-wise to, if you like, get it get it back to where it once was? Is that fair, me saying that? Yeah, I mean, look, I've been there since I started training 18 years ago. I stand. I've had plenty of opportunities to go elsewhere, but um, I love it and I really believe in it. Um, and I think there is, it's never going to be, get back to where it was. Um, you know, it was the biggest training centre in the country 70 odd years ago, middle of the last century. Uh, uh, it's never going to get back there because there's not the infrastructure in place to, to allow that to happen again because a lot of the yards have been built on and now houses. Um, you know, we are arresting that process um, and trying to reverse it. And we're looking to, you know, I think to from a peak of 670 horses in training, it had got down to 125 or something like that. We're building back up towards 200 now um, with a view to getting back to 300 plus, but that needs quite a few things to fall into place in terms of yard redevelopments and, and things like that, um, which um, you know, we're, say, on ours, hoping to have good news next month on. Um, Philip Mitchell's old yard, Downs House, that's got planning permission, and hopefully they're going to start building that early next year. That's a 70 box yard. Um, and there's one or two other things in the pipeline, and all of us, a number of new horses and, and trainers and owners, um, you know, you get this sort of self-fulfilling cycle, um, and you need a, a few good Saturday horses and big winners, and, um, um, you know, I think time and again, Epsom trainers have proven they can do the job with the ammunition they've got, and we've just got to increase the amount. And, and you are in the, the middle of yard redevelopment yourselves, are you? Well, that's, that's been an ongoing process. It's, it's been a... Um, you know, dread to think how many years, I mean we first started looking at redeveloping the yard, which is a very very old yard, it's over 150 years old um, within three years of me being there so in 2000 we'll be doing it um, and it's, uh, there's been all sorts of difficulties along the way with local opposition, local council bits and pieces, but we're now in the final stages of our application and we're, we're, we're looking to have it decided next month and we hope for a positive outcome and that would allow us to knock down complete the yard we've got there. We've got 60 boxes, but we can only really use about 20 to 23, 24 of those boxes. Um, and, and some of those sort of through gritted teeth. So we've really been happy for quite a long time now. If we can get the new yard, 60 boxes, brand new, purpose-built, modern yard, you know, we, we really feel we can kick on again. I suppose the, the, the Epsom issue, if you like, as a, as a training establishment and a fine training establishment and a fine racetrack it is, but in Place now, Kieran, in, in Newmarket, and the the redevelopment they've had in in recent times, and the injection of, of money they've had. Perhaps Epsom, Maddie, that the proximity to London, that there is a space issue there. Yeah, there is. I mean, as Jim said, I think it would be unrealistic to say we can get it. it was, but at the same time, I think more could be done. You know, whether that be by council on race days, and and when it comes to Derby, really giving it that sort of feel good fact I mean we published some photos after this year's derby of you know over the last couple of years what the the hill looked like for I think we just need to really connect back with the public um, and get them through the gates it's, a, it's an interesting one you go to Newmarket as well the the I know they've they've, um, they've done it with the the heritage center that's open there they've tried to encourage almost non-racing people to come to the town and then and then be a part 
of racing as well. Is there is there a disconnect, do you think, in the, in the town you train in between the, the local people there and, and, and the, the horses roaming the streets, if you like? Definitely, and, and that's a, a major thing that we're going to try and reverse, is, is this disconnect between town and, and, and the race course and the racing establishments better with the locals and get them to come along on this journey because you know it's, it's totally true Newmarket is a racing town you know it's racing foremost and and the, and the town goes along with it Epsom is a, a London suburb now it's uh, with with racing tacked on um, and we've got to definitely get that engagement and, and be much more cohesive with the local community was it a shock to your system Newmarket wise when you're you're, you're literally walking the horse across the, the zebra crossing with traffic coming both ways at you. Yeah, definitely it was a shock, but no, I think that, you know, the locals are all in with it, you know, I think it's a, it's a great environment around there in the morning. Uh, Jim, it, it, we'll, we'll discuss that perhaps a, a little bit more later on. We need to get into our uh, racing review and review what we've enjoyed over the last few days on Racing TV. Um, that the weekend was the, the Group 1 Phoenix Stakes. It was won by Jair Lyons, it was won by Siskin. It was just a five-runner affair, but it was a very, very good one. And the unbeaten Colts, Siskin, are lined up there, back over six furlongs. Um, you have Monarch of Egypt in there, who was perhaps, well, a chance of reversing that form for Siskin went off odds on, Maddie. But yeah, this, is a, this is a horse who, I think Jair describes him in the, the post today, whether he, he wanted to or not. We'll come to that, perhaps. But he, he describes him as... A feeling of the underdog, um, dog on the day, given how the the, the betting found it and, and how he went about it. This is a serious cult, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm a big fan of the cult, and I think it's really refreshing, isn't it, that we've not got an Aidan O'Brien no no trained juvenile. You know, it's Gerlines, it's someone new, it's Colin Keane, both of them not significant win with Siskin and for me this horse um, if you look at his pedigree it's, it's he's by um, first defense American sire and it's all very fast so I don't think this soft ground would have suited him or necessarily Monarch of Egypt but his asset is his turn of foot and if you look at the race Monarch of Egypt arguably gets first run on him a little bit but he's just got the class to come out but I'm convinced he's all about speed um, I wouldn't be thinking about a mile personally just yet um, and I think, you know, back on fast ground, that's the best of him. Well, and this was a great Group 1 performance, but, but Jer was saying, you know, that I, I was worried about the rain. It went soft. To, Jim, to, to your mind, uh, you know, horses like this, when they're that good, they count, for all they may have a ground preference, they can win on any ground. Um, yes, class will, will generally out, but there are some horses that, that absolutely won't perform to their best. Um, you know, when conditions go against them, and there's no doubt to win races like this, you need to be, you know, you need to be at your best. So, you know, if the horse really hasn't enjoyed the ground, he's still done what he's done. It's a superbly impressive performance. But I don't think every horse you'd say would, would get through soft ground and, and still um, and still be able to deliver even the class one because you know some it really really doesn't seem. I thought Monarch of Egypt about two fellows out had come to go on and win the race, and actually it's pretty. Comfortable. What's one Sisk in that race, to, to your mind, other, other than class? What specifically suited it there, do you think? I think that the turn of foot he showed was very impressive, you know, and, um, you know, what he, he battled on really game when they were upside, you know, he, he put his head down and he knuckled on well to put the race to bed, and I think the factor of it was his, his turn of foot, you know, and like, you know, Manny was saying, you know, speed, speed bread. I'm pleased to say that uh, Jer Lyons is on the phone now and, and can reflect on, on that performance on Friday night. Jer, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for, for joining us. In all that rain that fell the soft ground, how much of a concern was that for you for Siskin? Oh, it was huge because we know him on a dead gallop at home. He just, like his forte is that turn of speed, you know, when Colin asked him to go, he can put three lengths between him and the others was always going to just level the playing field a bit now but it was the same for every horse on the night I mean Monarch of Egypt I know they think a lot of him and he possibly wants better ground as well but we beat him on better ground um, so I just I was just very worried that button that we'd be stuck in the mud a bit but thankfully the horse pulled it out mm, he, he really did Kieran uh, Fallon who's in alongside saying that you know that that explosive turn of footy show perhaps won in the race how how quick is this horse with a view to, to what he might do? In Are you to making a decision as to, to what trip he might venture over next, Jer? Well, that's something we'll discuss. And as Teddy said, we leave the dust settle over the weekend. But, I mean, he'll be in all the, the relevant races. Obviously, the Middle Park uh, is sponsored by the owners. Uh, in the Vincent O'Brien over here. So they all come around the same time. And then you've got the Dewhurst. So, I mean, I'm not thinking anywhere beyond that at the moment. And... Um, 
I'd agree with everybody that there's no immediate uh, reason to be stepping him up in trip. Um, I'd like to see him back on nice ground. If you put the gun to my head at this moment in time, you'd have to be thinking it was the middle park would be his next race, but uh, we'll discuss that in the next week. Did you did you always feel at the start of the season, Jed, that, that, that this was your your, your best? feel he was, a, he was a very special horse, a Group 1 horse in the making, or, or has he surprised you with what he's achieved so far this year? No, I mean, at the start of the season, you never know what our two-year-olds are going to be. That's always a lucky bag, like a lucky dip. We don't know what's going to come out, and you just hope that we always know what we have regarding three-year-olds and older horses, and we genuinely thought we'd a mixed, ordinary bunch of older horses being, you know, who Steph, a, a genuine Group 3 horse, and Mustard Year was the best older horse we had, but the rest of them were just horses who were going So we were putting a lot of hope and faith in that the batch of two-year-olds we had, that something would pop its head up and be better than average, never hoping, you know, we're always hoping for a Group 1 horse, but I'm 20-odd years looking for one, so um, we weren't going to hold but, um Listen, once you've been chosen to train for Prince Khaled and you're on this team, anything is possible and it's just a huge privilege to be training for them. And I think as well, you know, your, your interviews afterwards, you and Colin, it's nice for us to see how much you're enjoying this, the both of you together. But, you know, you, you still had a group one up against the, the team Bally Doyle, if you like. But, you, you know, you, you've said that do you feel a little bit of underdog about you going in against those battalions. Do you, do you still sense that even with a cult of this class who's proved himself? No, listen, that's a little bit uh, tongue can never say a Judmont colour is an underdog. Mm. I mean, I'll be talking about Ger and, and and the jockey, but when when you're 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 going to war over here with Bally Doyle, with Bally Doyle every year, every day of the week, you know, Aidan's doing this reg is hard. Um, like normally, when push comes to shove in group races, or historically for me anyway, like in in our other colours, when we'd arrive at the furlong pole, like we did on Friday night. Aidens would click into gear and off they'd go, and, and it was just a nice surprise that we weren't found wanting. Listen, the, the underdog thing is just, you know, everybody is sort of, it's not fair on Aiden because they've brought the game to a new level over here, and, and I credit them with making the rest of us. Um, but when they're winning everything, just the general feeling is that they'd like somebody else to win, you know, so it's just nice that it was our turn on Friday. And you have, you've graced the front page of the, the Racing Post this morning, Jerry, and you've made your, your feelings clear about that. But is it fair to say from as far as the guineas goes that not thinking that way yet, you don't want to think that far ahead yet, trip-wise perhaps, or even into his three-year-old season because we're in August. It's one step at a time with this horse. Absolutely. That was just a ridiculous um, slow news day. The paragraph that was written by a young Mark didn't deserve a headline like that, and that's just it's just bad sub editing as, as far as I'm concerned. I was asked a, a very simple question, and and I don't bet it's irrelevant, absolutely irrelevant to me what price the horse is. I could, um, but at this time of the year, talking about nearly single digit figures for a guineas, which is next May, when you know, and every every member of your panel there knows that when Aiden starts launching these these machines or, or, or has done historically over the last, you know, from here on into the end of the season, you know that picture's going to change dramatically between now and then and there's every chance, every every horse bar maybe, maybe armoury on, on that screen that you have there won't even be figured in the guineas. Up, Jay, we've put it up. But you know, that's where we are, isn't it? You have a vintage stakes performance from a Pina Tubo and immediately get single figure quotes for, for a guineas and, and your horse wins a group one over six and, and we put him into that bracket. Um, and I, you know, I suppose if, if you do use, allow yourself to, to look ahead, he's, whether it's classic aspirations or not, you've got the, the Commonwealth Cup as well. You, know, you, you must be excited, all being well, to, to have a horse to go to war with as a three-year-old in those, in those races. I mean, and, and do you see him physically, Jer, as a horse that, that is going to develop really strong, a, a really capable Group 1 three-year-old? Are you living hope? I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not being glib, uh, Tom, but I'm not, I'm not looking that far ahead. I'm, I'm concentrating on his two-year-old career, and like you and I mightn't even be here next year, so we'll worry about when it, when it produces itself. But at the moment, I'm concentrating on 2019, and um, delighted to have a very good cult on my hands, and, and hopefully the years of failing has taught me how to look after one but from, from this point. He hasn't let me down, and it's a question of me not letting him down now from here on home.
Uh, Jed, thanks very much for your time. He's a brilliant colleague. Can I just say, Tom, Please can do. I just say, I worked with um, Kieran's mother, Julie, back in the day with Nigel Tinkler, and uh, I could just say he's a credit and uh, it's lovely to see him doing so well. Jer, you're very kind. You put a smile on his face as well. So uh, thank you very much indeed. Jer, great, to, great for you to join us this morning. Well done on Friday and good luck with Siskin and all the yard for the rest of the season. Thanks, Tom. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks to him for, for joining us there and for talking about Siskin. Great performance it was on Friday night. It was a great weekend for uh, William Haggis as well, who we've already talked about the, this morning with uh, Kieran Fallon, who, of course, that's where he, he's working at the moment in Newmarket. Now, this was the Group 3 road. This was uh, Dave winning another group race off the back of, I suppose, what was a, a bit of a disappointment at York. Ask William about that very shortly. Uh, but this gym seems to be where this horse is at his very best over this sort of trip. And specifically, we've talked about ground being important. We say it seems to be important to, to, to a Dave for him to show his best cut in the ground. Yeah, I think there's plenty of evidence of that now, and um, and, and and this was just further further proof. Um, you know, travelled very strongly into it, and um, and and put the race to bed nicely. So, he's clearly a very good horse. And he, he won a, a Lincoln, of course. He then tried to step up in the Lockings, perhaps was poorly drawn on on that occasion, and didn't get his ground. And then it's taken a while, Maddie, for him to to get back to this. It didn't quite work out last season, Champion Stakes, etc. Seemingly, just just showing, I think exactly what we all thought he was capable of. Yeah, and as Jim's mentioned, I think a lot of that is down to the ground. Um, we've seen that obviously with him. I mean, what he did, what Ascot was really impressive as well. He sort of showed an electric turn of foot, and he got in all sorts of trouble. He's clearly a very capable horse. Entries in uh, the Judmont and the Champion Stakes, so it'd be interesting to see what William says. Have you sat on him at home? Yep, I galloped him. Um, you know, he gives me some feel in the morning. Um, but, but you know, the ground is very crucial to him, and. You know, when he gets that soft ground, he just really is. I mean, is he, is he one that, we, you know, you've got on him in the morning and you, and you, you can feel that difference? Yeah, you, you, know, you know you're sat on a good horse when you, when you sit on him. He's a, you know, he's a powerful horse and, you know, he gets through that soft ground very easily and he, he proves it um, He proves it when he runs on the, on the soft ground. Yeah, he was, he was excellent yesterday. William Haggis joins me on the line. I'm pleased to say off the back of William, what was a, a great day for you yesterday, a six-timer. Many congratulations. Thank you very much, Tom. I thought Kieran was going for a haircut yesterday morning. But... <laughs> I, w I wondered how long it, it, it would be until you mentioned something like that. Have you had one, Kieran? Yeah, I had one, yeah. <laughs> it looks, it's very short back and sides, long at the front. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. For fashion. <laughs> I can highly recommend it. Um, William, Dave, and, and, and this season, has he, has he shown you everything that you, you, you hoped he would last season when perhaps things didn't quite work out? Well, he, 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 he was very impressive at Ascot. Um, I thought he was really good there. And I don't think he's been quite as good since. And I think he's possibly a better horse fresh. And uh, I think, as, as everyone's alluded to, the ground is very important to him. But he's, he's a, a good galloping horse and he's worked pieces and, uh, you know, he's pretty effective on heavy ground. Uh, j reflect on on York if you can. It just just I, I know he was a little bit short of room late on, but I mean to your mind he he was beaten there, was he? And, and just not quite showing his best on that day. Yeah, for, for, I mean, we thought it, the same was going to happen yesterday, where they were predicting tons of rain, but York didn't actually get as much as as they thought we were going to get, and I don't think the ground was actually as quite as soft as he likes it now. I was getting videos from my travelling team uh, of rain teeming down. It was marvellous. And uh, Richard said the ground was very loose and very uh, uh, very heavy, but they were going through it. Well, that is perfect. As far back as the Lincoln. I mean, it was bottomless that day, and he absolutely sluiced up. Will you... Do you think you will venture back into Group 1 company with this horse? Has he earned his right off the back of yesterday to, to go back up into that company? I think Group 1 races on heavy ground can have completely different results to the, to the same race on fast ground. So there's obviously one obvious race at the end of the season, uh, which is over seven figures. And it, it, it's been run on heavy ground for the last two or three years. Mm. I think that's that's the right way forward for him. Um, Miss O'Connor was was excellent as well. Does she fit into that that bracket as well as a, a filly that's better with a bit of? 
limited evidence we've seen so far? Well, seemingly. I mean, we have we have uh, run a twice on soft ground. Georgia rode her at, uh, at uh, Nottingham and said she, it felt like good ground on her. And then um, suited her well and she's a listed winner. But I'd like to give some credit to my son who, who rang me up and said there's a filly in Ireland who's never run before won a maiden at Gore and then she ran a very good figure and I think she's a stakes filly and I said give it up and uh, and uh, um, so he ran through the pedigree which confirmed that he was talking nonsense anyway he uh, persuaded one of our clients to buy her and fair play to him she's she, but uh, she can run a bit and she's I love the way she gallops she, she loves it up the front and She's a very genuine filly, and uh, I think she's got more to offer. Uh, uh, Sheen wasn't so sure that she had to have it. Uh, so we will try on, it on a bit better ground. But I think uh, the fact that when it's really soft, she handles it, then, um, you know, it does slow the others down too. Mm. And could she step up and trip, and would there be perhaps a, a later season race for her? Um, I thought she could step up and trip. Um, but uh, Asheen wasn't so sure. Um, I thought she was going away again at the line. And I thought uh, once he copped hold of her, she, she really stretched well. So I think she wouldn't. Uh, I've got her in no smart races, but um, now she's won a listed race and created some value. Uh, I think we'll start making a few better entries. But I don't know how far she'll go, but she's come a hell of a long way in um, two starts. You nearly got even better last night. Awesome tank ran, ran really well at, at the Beverly D. You delighted with that? Oh, I was absolutely thrilled to bits with her. And she's really enjoyed the training. We, they've been sending us videos um, of her work, daily work. And she was Larry out there. And I thought she was sensibly ridden. The, the, the um, pacemaker went a million. Uh, but she stuck to her task really well. Uh, the winner's obviously a very good filly. Smashed the track record. And she's now won five. That's the first Group One or Grade One she's ever run in Orson Tank, and she was clear second best. And I was absolutely thrilled to bits with her. Yeah, and a great bit of prize money for for the owners and yourselves, etc., to, to pick up as well. It would be let you go without asking you to, to just comment on the the chap that's sat two to my left, young Kieran Fallon. He's been very nice about you, William. So your chance to return the favour or not, if you like. Well, unfortunately, I haven't been able to watch because Sunday's always, as he will know, a pretty busy morning. Um, so I shall watch after I get back from uh, Leicester tonight. But he's done really well. Don't don't uh, be under any illusions. This young man has uh, he's done, he's got a very bright future. He's a very sensible. Works very hard, and he couldn't ride a horse. He hadn't ridden a horse two years ago, and now he's buying. Uh, for leading apprentice and, uh, and he's sensible. I think he's tightening up very well his riding. He's a good family behind him and he's got a lot to offer. And his mate, uh, our, our apprentice who rides in the other, one of the other apprentices, Dan Lucasana, rode his first winner the other day for someone else uh, at Haydock and uh, the favourite and he was absolutely as thrilled as Jan Luca was that he won. So. He's got a bit of uh, uh, human kindness in him too. He's going to go a long way, Karen, and uh, if we can look after him and uh, he keeps his head on, uh, keeps being sensible and thoughtful, he'll go a long way. I'm sure you will, will help a great deal with that. William, thanks very much indeed. Well done again yesterday. Thank you, Tom. I was at Haydock when Gianluca, Sardinian jockey, been a few good ones coming. Did you get you? Did you drive back together? Yeah, yeah. Got got a lift with Dad. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I saw you both. You were both all smiles getting into the car after. He was delighted with that, wasn't he, young Jen Luke? No, yeah. Look, it was um, it was a long time in waiting, but you know, you it, you give it such a good ride up the inside. Of credit for the ride he gave, he gave it, and you know, I know it went well, but look, he gave it a good ride, hands and heels all the way, and you know, it, it, it meant a lot to him, and I'm I'm pleased he's got his first winner, and I think he deserves a lot more opportunities than he actually gets. Yeah, he gave it some. To, to him, he rode the, the winner of the last at Haydock on Thursday. Um, let's move on to uh, juveniles. West End girl 
I took the Sweet Solera at Newmarket yesterday. Um, she had been over seven furlongs before. She was beaten on that occasion. She opposed with the, the Godolphin filly. Um, she was one of the more experienced in those. Well, she had a couple of starts, I suppose, as opposed to, say, Ultraviolet, who seemingly didn't run her race. But I suppose, importantly, it's a first group winner as well for, for Golden Horn, Maddie, which is... is I think she was his first winner as well. She's up against the rail on that stage. Stalls one and two with the first two home here. But she had that battling quality. She wasn't really given a chance to show it at Sandown, but she showed it here. Yeah, exactly. That Sandown race was really messy in the closing stages. You see uh, Romsey there in the in the. I think that filly was in the race as well, and she was sort of unlucky. But uh, yeah, West End girl, you really saw her stamina come into play in the sort of last half of furlong of this. And typical Mark Johnson horse, you know, toughs it out right to the line. Um, the horse behind her, Sir Michael Sofikia, I think she's called, um, she ran quite an eye-catching race. But, um, yeah, I think they're probably quite closely matched, some of these. Yeah, she, well, she was up there throughout, as we're accustomed, I think, to, to seeing um, from, from horses at this track. Not just yard, Jim, who have great success at, at this track. I mean, to your mind, just, just the, the July courses... If you're sending a horse there, is there a place you'd like to be on the track, a, a rail-wise, or perhaps positioning in the race, or, or does it for you depend on the horse? Tom, I don't have enough run. Firm opinion on that. I mean, I, I you know haven't had any runs there this year, and uh, you know, for, for me to comment on that sensibly, I'd, I'd you know I'd be lying if I could give you a really firm opinion. I mean, it's look, it's, it's always seemed a fairly fair course to me. Um, you know, we've had runners there over the years. I've never been too wide where I was coming, to be honest with you. Um, but, yeah, I wouldn't have that number of runners that I'd firm, form a strong opinion. It was amazing that, that Newmarket raced on good to firm ground and tighten up ground, given the rain that we had everywhere else. Um, she battled on, on pedigree as though she's a, a, a filly that's going to get a bit further. In your time riding there, Kieran, do, do, I mean, was there something about that race, you think, that, that suited her positioning in any way? Do you, do you see, you know, July course-wise, a, a fair enough track to, to ride over? Has your dad passed on anything about that? You know, you get winners that come from behind, you get front runners winners. But now, look, typical Mark Johnson horse there, t toughing it out in the front, getting a few bumps and battled on really well. And then, you know... She went away winning, so look, I think she'd be an exciting filly for the future. Just open up that the chat on, on or, or fillies that we've seen so far this season. Um, I know Jay was talking about how we, we look. We do get ahead of ourselves, don't we? We're, we're all, we, we spend most of the spring trying to find next year's Guineas winner. But on, on that bet we saw for the Guineas, for example, just turning attention. Tubo on what he's achieved is rightly at the, the top of that for you, Maddie. Yeah, it's interesting. He'd have to be, wouldn't he, after his vintage stakes performance. Um, it's interesting. Siskin, for me, at the minute, looks more of a sprinter type. And Pinatobo, perhaps, you know, he always hits the... He's not overly big. That's one thing that we might mention. You know, maybe there's less scope than you'd expect for a horse like him going forward next year. But he understandably has that place in the market. But I'm sure as... Jez alluded to, there's going to be plenty more Bally Doyle. That's the, the 2,000 guineas betting. As far as the, the 1,000 goes, of course, off the back of that performance, uh, West End Girl would have been considered a candidate for the race, for all she's not right up there in the, in the betting. Just on juveniles that, that you've sent out, Jim, and, and, and those that you, you come up against, I mean, how... How difficult is is it for you per se when you're you're up against the big powerhouses and the the do, do you do you try and pick and choose and see what's likely to go where to, to yours or is it a case that you know you're you're plotting for the future with your youngsters and you, you get a bit of experience into them wherever they run? Yeah, Tom, I mean, I, you know, I'd have five or six two year olds a year um, and generally bought at the lower end of the spectrum or, or homebred um, and it's very rare that you're going to have one that you can. I think you're going to go to war within their first couple of runs, thinking they'll win a maiden or a novice. So, we very much have an eye to the future when we're when we're you know looking at um, looking at our two-year-old campaigns. So, you know, we'd love to have 40, 52 year old blue bloods and try be plotting campaigns where you can try and win maidens and novices. But the reality of the situation is is generally pretty different. So, um, you know, you don't have to look at our two-year-old record. Two-year-old winners for us are rare, um, but from a fairly small small field, and you know progress horses on from 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 you know where the handicap marks start and uh, you know get get the best out of them as time goes on what will be the mixture age wise of all the horses you've got in the yard then if you say you've got five or six juveniles in there well, so we've got about 22 horses um so five or six two-year-olds um 
six or seven three-year-olds and, and the rest four-year-old and upwards. So, um, you know, we've got a, a broad range. But, yeah, we we wouldn't have the, the, the breadth of two-year-olds to be, to be going to war with that we'd, we would ideally like in the future. And as far as juveniles go, Kieran, anything that, that you've seen that you've sat on as a young horse that you've really been taken by perhaps we haven't seen the best of yet but but anything out there that you you think is lurking or anything that you have been very impressed by juveniles wise um you know obviously five pound apprentice you don't really get to sit on you know the, the two-year-olds as much um so i've not really sat on you know one that I, I could you know say but you know um mr haggis has got a nice a nice bunch of two-year-olds coming through you know he does a does a good job with them looks after them so hopefully there's a few more to come out of the at the yard yeah, Jim Crack just around the corner. She's got a, a of course. Um, where are you? So you're Leicester today. You were going to be Windsor, and now you're Leicester. Yeah, yeah. The plan was uh, to go to Windsor, but now obviously we've been changed. You know, two nice rides up there. So hopefully we can you can get a winner. And it's going to be a busy week off the back of that. You, I mean, you must be amazed at how many. How now you got many horses you're riding day in day out. Has it has it taken a bit of getting used to? Yeah, yeah. You know, at the start of the year we'd be getting one ride, two rides a day, but now look, I had six yesterday. You know, and obviously the amount of rides I'm getting is, you know, it's getting higher. So hopefully, and, uh, you know, the winners keep coming in. Kieran, thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure to have you in this morning. I know you've got to hot foot it off to uh, Leicester. Maddie and Jim are sticking around. Emma Sale will be in shortly as well. We're going to take a little pause uh, when you do rejoin us. It'll be part two of my chat. Still to come on Luck on Sunday this Sunday morning, Emma Sayer is in the studio talking about what a brilliant night that was at Carlisle, her recent retirement, and what may lay ahead. Luck on Sunday, proudly sponsored by Albasti at Cruel, Dubai. Did you know as a Racing TV member, you and a guest can go racing every month of the year? Simply apply online for the dates you want at racingtv.com slash club dates. Simple. All you'll need on the day is your Racing TV metal badge and the printed e-ticket to gain admission. If you're lucky enough to get VIP tickets, you'll have access to the Racing TV reserved area for the day. This includes free tea and coffee and a pre- of our presenters and pundits. If you're lucky enough to get a club day, it's absolutely terrific. It's a uh, friendly atmosphere and it's just a fantastic day out. If you come once or twice a month, then you know, you're know paying for itself, really. You get a chance to go in the paddock, a chance to kick the best turned out horse and uh, give the lad 50 quid. The lad was jumping all over the place. Fantastic, you know. Oh, give it a try. It's, uh, it's definitely worth it. For the full list of club days, go to racingtv.com slash club. Added each quarter, so keep checking back. So you've seen the show on TV, why not come and live it on track at a Racing TV club day? On Sunday, proudly sponsored by Albasti at Cruel, Dubai. Nicky has really developed that reputation that's been built over time of, of getting horses to be able to come back and back to their best. Sprinter, of course, coming back from, from his issues to, to win a, a champion chaser. And Altior as well to, 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 to win at Newbury en route to, to, to his champion chase. He, he really has been the master of that and you were, you were such a part of it. He gives him time to come back. He will the horse tell him. 
and he does, his patience is unreal. You would say, like, you know, this whole and then they get on with him. But now he waits and waits gradually, gradually waits for the horse. And next thing you see the horse jumping and kicking. And I thought, ooh, there he is. That's why he, that's why he knows the horse. Yeah, yeah, he waits for us. So Spent it was a great example. And they did really, didn't they? That's what a hard problem. Came and left him all whole year, left him alone, didn't bother him. Brought him back in to training. Walk and trot, walk and trot. Had one hack now and again. Waited, waited, waited. Until he see that horse. Inside out and he said, he's back. That's how good he is as a trainer. Patience. And also with Sprinter, not just to get him back, having tried to come back. It wasn't as if he came back from injury and won it straight away. He came back that year and was beaten. I think he, I think he pulled up first go, and I think a lot would have drawn stumps then and said, well, we tried. But you still kept going, and the following year got him back and got him back to win. Good as ever, yeah. How, how it's, it's a how great achievement. Like, it feels great achievement. We all... I was a miracle to bring him back and do what he did. In. I mean, it was incredible, really. Were you involved in that process, Corky? We're all involved. Everybody in the yard is involved with horse. Of all the champion chase, I think there have been there have been six. Is he, or was he, the the most talented, raw ability-wise, Sprinter Sacra? Top two, anyway. Well, who's, the, who, who's the other? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, Altiora's <laughs> got to be put in, put in, put in there. If some people say he's not better, but. We can't say. You can't say. You'd like to say, but you can't say. They have their, their differences, though. Yeah, of course they, they do, yeah. Two different types of strains, developed horses. Two different, different characters. Big, proud. That's when he carries his head on the floor. During the racing and everywhere. But you wouldn't want to see him this time of the year. He'd frighten you. <laughs> Would he, yeah? Well, he touches the ground now and again when he's riding out. Altaria. Like, like, a very lively duel this time of the year for about three months. <laughs> but uh, great horse, isn't he? I feel like we've jumped, Corky. We've, got, we've talked about see you then right, right near the start to the most recent champion chase winners. In, in, that, in that interim time, there, there were some, in, some incredible horses, champion hurdle winners, etc. Yeah. Who, who really sticks in your, in your mind from that middle period? Yeah, Remittance Man, Remittance Man was a good chaser, mm. champion chaser. I was wondering, of course, he wouldn't, as he said, me or she didn't win. Because mm. we never had the same followers no, up to then. But uh, we, I backed, oh, well, we always had a few quid in the middle. And, 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 uh, but that's part of it. Part of but that's part yeah. of it, particularly the National Hunt game. Did that always give you a bit of satisfaction in, in October, November, looking ahead to March and going? We did. We had, we had, we had a triumph. We never had a triumph runner. Never had a Cheltenham runner. Never, never mind anything else. Hmm. We thought this could win a triumph. So as Christmas come, he hadn't ran. The bad weather set in. In January, he hadn't ran, and I was getting worried with my little few quidditch way. And um, Governor came out and he says, we're going to get a job, to get a run into him. He said, you know, he says, the only place we can go. I said, where? He says, Plumpton. I said, what? Jeez, you wouldn't run a donkey there. We, we've got to qualify. You, you can't, you know, if he doesn't win a race, he doesn't qualify at that time. I was like, Jesus, Plumpton. So anyway, he, ran him because he runs in Plumpton, wins, easy, of course. Afternoon. Must yeah, have been, I, think, yeah. I think it was a Monday, yeah. Anyway, thought we were, at least he's qualified. He had a back, had a going back three days afterwards. He said, Nicky, you're not qualified for the race. The race he won was a... Because there was 70 horses that won two races. And he said, the race he's really she won is just penny hit me race. He'll have to go again. And I said, where are we going to go? Only one. It says ten days before Cheltenham. I think he likes to give you sort of a bit of plenty of rest mm. between. He says, "Yeah, well, that's all we can do. If we got to run. He'll see the other thing is not to run." Oh, I said, "He'll have to go to Newbury. <laughs> He'll have to go to Newbury." So anyway, we went to Newbury. 
he had only one twenty limbs, I think. So, and, and then, then came the triumph, and the rest is history. And the, tri the triumph, which was relief. A good day. But we knew we could train one then. We knew we could get one ready. We knew we had a good one before it happened, which is nice. Uh, it was great to catch up with Corky Brown earlier on in the week. Uh, what a guy to chat to and, and reflect on an amazing career. Um, another retirement has been announced. Not quite such a, a long career, a different one as well. Uh, but to my left has, I think, gone out on good terms with the industry as far as being a jockey goes. And Emma, it could be training which lies ahead. First of all, great to have you here. Well done last Monday with, uh, with Radan and at Ascot prior to that. And... Now and, and that's it as far as, as being a jockey goes. Yes, um, thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, yes, I'm, I've had the chance for the last week to reflect on, you know, everything in the last 11 years, and I'm to be sat here having had a many highs um, over the last 11 years and just a couple of lows. If if somebody had sat you down, say four years ago, and, and said four years time you you will be hanging up your boots I mean would, would that then have been to you? Yes probably because four years ago I was riding as an apprentice and I thought you know I was I was going to have a long career riding that was my dream um, but then you know things happen and you pass um, but we've gone with it and it's it's all worked out. I mean, you say things happened. I mean, <laughs> effectively breaking your neck is is a huge thing to happen to to any jockey. Just take us back to the first instant, if you if you can. What happened, and 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 where were you, and how serious was it? Yeah, the first time I fractured my neck, I was racing in Dieppe in 2013, um, and I was on an invitation race for the for Gentry. I was the for Gentry re representative. And I'd had a winner in Catan, a winner in Oman, and my season was, was really great. Um, but then I went to Dieppe and I had my fall and broke my neck. But actually, that cloud had a silver lining because I meant, it meant I lost just over a stone. And covered, I was able to come back as an apprentice, um, which opened up more opportunities for me. That's quite a positive to take, <laughs> to take out of that. But I appreciate you putting a positive spin on it. Um, I mean, did you, did you, we always, felt that you were going to come back from it. I mean, breaking your neck sounds incredible. Specific injury, it was, it was never a case of anything hugely serious. It was, it was going to be, you, you would be able to return to race riding and you were comfortable with that. Yeah. The first time it was, you know, it was a, it was a relatively straightforward fracture of the neck. And cause I remember begging my mum to let me just hack around the roads with my neck brace on because I was just desperate to get to get back on board. The second time possibly wasn't quite as straightforward because there was more soft tissue damage to the neck and we knew it would be recovery. And I think mentally, having gone through it the first time, I think on reflection, I didn't want to chance it and be going through that for a third time as well. So off the back of the first time, how old were you when the first time it happened? Sorry. I was 21. So career ahead of you, um, you have that, that huge setback. Was there, was there no element of you that thought, I'm a young girl that's just done this. Do I really want to get back on a horse? There was no fear element, anything like that. No, surprisingly, after the first time I did it, I was raring to go. I was back on board. And it never, because I think it happened in France and it happened on a horse that um, I'd never sat on before and it happened over the steeplechase, I never rode over fences again. Mother and I discussed it and we said no more over fences, but no. I had a second question after that first initial fall. And you had a, you know, you had a really good couple of seasons as well riding on the flat, didn't you? And, 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 and you know, did you, uh, then what were the, what were the aspirations for Emma Sayre? What was Emma Sayre going to go on and become? Well, I was, you know, every day was a new challenge because I'm a, a strongly built girl and I, my bottom weight, I got down to eight stone one, which was a struggle. And initially I was extremely disciplined and, you know, I, I saw it as, well, if I can be disciplined and maintain my weight, then there's endless opportunity. Within sort of a year and a half, my weight started creeping up and I started to think, oh, actually, this is a real tough, tough road ahead. Um, and then the turning point from going apprentice back to amateur was when I won the uh, jockey club 
Development Award. Uh, that was my 25th winner and you can ride 25 winners as an apprentice before you're not allowed to revert back to an amateur. So on that 25th winner I said right I'll go back amateur and because it, by that point my really I was really struggling with it. Uh, that uh, is no longer in existence that award now but that was for, for winning at Carlisle then going on to win the, the the, the culmination race, if you like, at Haydor. Yes. You did, did, did it make a huge, a different, huge, huge difference to you? Oh, huge. I mean, having won that into different meetings to discuss what would you like to do with that money, how can it aid your career? And the very first thing I did, I put um, Cool Baranga, who is a 15-time winning mayor, who's won 11 races for me, we put her into full. So actually, I now have a year but hopefully one day my dream will be to train him myself and he will be my first runner on the course. Whether that happens or not, you know, who knows. But that was an opportunity that I wouldn't have been able to do. Um, it allowed me to pay towards my training courses and my trailer test. I've been abroad. You know, it's, it's money gives you opportunity, doesn't it? And I was so lucky to have won that. And how did you, look, this is a topic we're, go, we're going to, to come on to in talking points and perhaps off the back of that as well, but uh, how, how did you find general opportunities in the racing world? You know, I think sometimes we are so, we're negative, we have a negative outlook on what we have, but yet I think in reflection, there's lots of opportunity out there. Um, you, you never by by being a, a young female rider, you 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 felt you had plenty of opportunity. Yes, absolutely. I feel the jockeys in the weighing room they were very supportive, um, and I think that every trainer that I rode for, they turned me riding for them into a positive. Whether their horse needed a possibly a more sympathetic ride, or you know, I think trainers do their best to do the right thing for the horse. And if the right thing for the horse is putting a girl on or a guy on, that's what they're going to do. I think regardless, you know, they tried to do horses and... Let's, let, I know that's something we're going to come back to. Um, with regard to your second injury, was that a very similar injury? That was Carmel, wasn't it? That was at Carmel uh, last summer, yes. And how, I mean, what back and tried to look at the footage and you can't actually see yourself coming off. You were on the front runner, front runner was going back through the field, the tree bend, you, you turn in, you see a horse in front kick up a little bit mm. and then obviously you don't see you, you come down but, but you did come to grief there. How much were you aware of, of what had happened to you? Um, well I was very aware, you know as soon as we stumbled and I hit, hit the floor, I, I, having had the injury I knew that it was going to be a very similar outlook to my previous injury and the first C3 and my C4 and that time last summer I fractured my C4 and my C5 but also had soft soft tissue damage as well. Is, is that, so, excuse my ignorance on this, is that something you get up and walk away from? Uh, well the first time I did actually but no, um, I died there and I did not move and they actually air ambulanced me to Preston Hospital. Where was mum? Mum was right there with me. I mean, we were, I actually was devastated because I had Ailani, who was the favourite in the final race, which was an amateur race. I was gutted because I thought he had a really, really good chance. And not only had I, was I missing out on the ride, they then didn't have an amateur to ride mm. our horse in the last race. I mean, I don't think it was relevant to Mum at the time or my sister's. I was probably their main priority, but, you know, it was it was... I think it was hard for the family to take again. And what was it like family discussions off the back of that when it, when it became clear that you were going to perhaps in a slightly different vein and, and not quite so seriously return to, to race persuaders about that, saying, look, you've had a couple now. Or you yourself, were you more realistic about the challenges that lay ahead? Had you, had you changed a bit mentally off the back of that? I think, I think so. I think I needed to be more realistic. And, um, you know, obviously there were very... I'm still only 27, you know, I have a, hopefully a lot of life ahead of me. Um, and my family have always been very supportive. And when I said, I want to ride, it's, my, it's in my blood, it's my passion. Um, we discussed and I was only on the flat. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'm not as eager to get on anything and I'm not as brave anymore. To, uh, if there's a difficult one on, on the ad, I'm not the first to volunteer anymore. Um, but no, I was always going to try and come. In the Jack Berry house, they did a tremendous job to get me physically fit and recovered as quickly as we could. It is a remarkable place, though, oh, isn't it? 
Where, without that, would you have struggled? I think so, because my injury was a little bit more complex with the soft how to manage my return. You know, I was there, it was a just under six months it took me from falling to being back on the race course and you know they worked very hard and they worked with me and not only did they work with me physically but I was seeing Kinsella from Jets as well and he provided a huge support to listen to your worries to open your eyes to what other opportunities you could get and he was really great in um, supporting me and I actually Discussions with Phil. I actually applied for the Alex Scott Future Trainers um, Travel Scholarship, and I, I was successful in my application. And so, actually, that opportunity led me to go to Florida this winter and work for Graham in in America. So, I said, look, a lot of positives have come of, of weight, but I think talking to you, much as that has come from you and your outlook, you seem a very positive person. Well, I think you have to be, and actually I always try and find a positive that you can. You can always find a positive in any situation, and I think positivity will attract more positivity. And don't get me wrong, I can still complain and I can still twine, but I think you need to, I think you need to be realistic, but try and find positive. I mean, we're actually very, very fortunate. I've had so many opportunities through racing. I think racing are trying to drive the whole industry forward. I mean, you only have to look now in, in Yards for Stable Staff, there's mentoring and there's coaching for young jockeys, uh, jockey coaches. There's jets that are constantly trying to engage current jockeys in training. And for people like me, who's now in a bit of an in-between stages, there's things like the Toby Balding Award and the scholarship available and I think there's so much out there if you open your eyes and actually try to strive forward. So what is what is lying ahead for you Emma? Is it is it is it you and your, your mum together going and going and training together a sort of double-pronged attack on it? Is, is that the Yeah absolutely I since my return from America which was my real transition into wanting to train looking at things from a trainer's point of view as opposed to a jockey's point of view. Um, I've loved working with my mum. She is brilliant and very well as a team. And there's always been a little bit of chat that, oh, I'll take over from her and I'm going to push her out. Absolutely not. I don't think she would hand over the reins anytime soon. Um, but hopefully one day we'll be com competition. No, I think I've got an awful lot still more to learn. How, how good was... Carlisle last last Monday and and Radana was it the dream fairy tale? Had you not have won on Radana, would you have stepped down? I think so. I think having won at Ascot the previous absolute dream, um, and then to follow up at Carlisle in front of your home crowd with your friends and your family was just the icing on the cake. And, and you just you you were saying to me off air, you know, we know the horse goes. Yeah, that was always the plan. As you could see, the rail actually came out into the middle of the track, so it was almost easier to keep coming to this outside rail as it would be to, you know, go back to the inside rail. And once he has got that rail on his to his left, he stays very straight. With him to get him to keep going forward, and you know, he's such a gutsy little animal, and he's in a career high mark, and yet he stuck his neck out, and he wanted to win just as much as I did that night. What was that feeling like? I was just completely elated, completely elated. Know that you were you were going to say that's it? No, I don't think so. I, I discussed it with my mum the night before. I said I think it would be a huge relief when tomorrow's over. And I think without saying any more, mum knew and I knew she knew. Relief for, for you that you that you didn't actually have to go and ride again, or or just or just the 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 pressures that come with it. It's not that you weren't enjoying riding, but you it's about you've got to make that step away to, to progress down the road you want to go down, is that fair? Yeah, I think it was... I'm ready to embrace what's next. I don't know what entirely is next, um, but I got to a point, and Monday was the finale of that, of I'm ready to move on and see what lies ahead for me. What is that night like for you? A year ago um, for, for Racing TV and saw a fantastic evening um, a great crowd in at, at Carlisle and, and lots of people enjoying racing and, and to my eye great opportunities for the for the female riders on the night. What's it like to, to ride in and, and what 
specific evening in the ladies only mm. races? Well firstly how lucky are we to have uh, a meeting completely dedicated to female jockeys. Um, I think for the, from an amateur point of view it's great for us amateurs to ride against give you a chance to up your game you know but I think actually for the professional lady jockeys it's an opportunity for them to showcase their talent and there's fierce rivalry in the weighing room between the amateurs and the professionals which all adds to the excitement and the actually I think they put on some very very good races mm. I mean um, they, were, they were good finishes there was a lot of positives to take from Monday night at Carlisle. Just you so you and about where you are and your, your position in the country and, uh, and where you're based mm -hmm. um, just tell us a, a little bit about what that's like, where you are, the, the training establishment. I've personally never been there. What, what, uh, what's the, the establishment like? Well, we're very fortunate. My father's a trainer. Uh, so we train on our farm. Um, we, we've got an all weather gallop, an arena, a, a treadmill and a walker. But we are actually very fortunate that we've got lots of fields, lots of grassland. I mean, Dad's very, very good to have use of his fields to work and we've got a variety of different fields that will you'll work different horses on um, we're just a small small yard up in Cumbria but we're actually very well located in that we're just off the M6 you drive between junction 39 and 40 all the way up in Cumbria on the M6 you drive actually right through the farm so you can see the gallop on one side and the horses turn out paddocks on the other um, we're an all-female yard there's only sort of the five girls of us but great dynamics within our yard everybody loves the job they all know the roles and our horses are incredibly happy they're very chilled out they're very happy and they're performing for us this is our best ever flat season that we've had and our I think we're 17% over jumps and 20% on the flat at the moment and we know it's not going to continue and last forever but we are embracing it at the moment. I mean it might, it, it, you're going along absolutely brilliantly at the moment across both codes as you say, you, you personally, do you, you know in, in a few years time do you want to be a flat trainer, do you want to be a national hunt trainer, are you not pigeonholing yourself as yet? Yeah I'm not entirely sure, I always thought well the jump racing is where my passion is but actually I can really see the positives of training flat can probably run them more regularly there's an awful lot of meetings to go around so you can find races to suit your horses um, normally injury injury levels aren't as high um, you know and then you know, it's pleasant going racing on a summer's evening rather than going to Catrick on the 1st of January when it's absolutely Baltic <laughs> <laughs> did you enjoy riding over jumps more than you did on the flat initially? Um, I, I loved it. I mean, I actually was fortunate a couple of summers with Guy McCare mm. in France and he taught me an awful lot about rhythm and about having your horse in rhythm to allow it to jump. Don't, don't interfere. He used to always say, don't interfere, let the horse jump, give it its head. And I think he taught me you know, only 17 and 18 going out there to get the horses to jump for you. And that used to always be my aim, just think about the rhythm, don't push, don't pull, think about the rhythm. And I loved, I loved riding over jumps. My, my dream was always to ride, ride um, the Fox Hunters at the, the national meeting. And I had a horse, that, but I missed out on qualifying him. I th had to finish third in the last hunter chase at Carlisle, and I finished fourth, beating ahead. But actually, I think that was Still positive. In hindsight. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> We had Guillaume came in actually and, and spoke to. He was uh, the most fascinating man to listen to, and I imagine as a, a young rider going and learning from, from someone like him was was absolutely incredible. Going into the the training, we talked about being a being a, a jockey, and, and and you're you know going to go on to be a a, a female trainer um, in, in a world where there are more male trainers. Do you, do you you know is your mum a source of inspiration for you in that sense? Absolutely. I mean, both my grandmother Evelyn Slack, who was permit trainer. Actually, um, and my mum, they are very, very tough. And you know, I think in this game, it is a male-dominated game. Um, I mean, there's an awful lot of girls that come through to the racing school, but they don't. You don't then see be a jockey or be a trainer. And I think because 
life is tough. You've got to work extremely hard. And I think if you've got the right work ethic, you know, you, you're going to succeed. And mum has been an absolute inspiration. She's always, she's and she does her very best. I mean, we, we train a handful of horses for working class people, and we try and provide them with great days at the races. Is, you know, would she, does she have a similar outlook to you, do you think? If ever, ever she be the sort of type to, to put a brave face on it and always, always look at the positives? Do you know when things are perhaps getting to, to her and the team? Yeah, absolutely, but I mean, you've, you've got to have a little bit of perspective on life. And when I, was, when I took two years away from the sport and I was a teacher, it gave me the, the best perspective because it made me realise there's an awful lot more to life. And quite often when you're racing, you're in this bubble of racing. And actually coming back into it, it made me think, I'm going back into racing because it's the sport I love. I'm passionate about it. Yes, you're going to have the lows, but you've also, also got to embrace the highs. You've got to enjoy the positive days. So you took, you actually took a, com a complete two years out to, to be a teacher, or were you, were you juggling both at that stage? I did ride as an amateur. I only had a couple of winners during those two years because when you're teaching, actually, as much as you get the 14 weeks holiday and you get every weekend off, there's an awful lot more to being a teacher than what anybody ever thought there was. Um, but it taught me a lot. It taught me that organising organisation is key. And if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. And actually, dealing with children, as much as you have to get into children's heads, just like you have to try and get into your horse's heads. Back, unfortunately. <laughs> um, was there ever a serious point where you thought, that's it, racing, racing world, I'm, I'm going to go on and be a teacher, or did you know you'd come? Well, what led you to do that? You know, what was it? You just wanted to have something else in case you didn't succeed or didn't pursue the, the dream if you... Um, I finished school and I went straight into university. I was desperate at the time to go straight into racing and my mum said no, you get your education, you get a degree and then after, what you do after that is up to you. So she forced me to get to university and I travelled to Lancaster which is only 45 minutes down the road so I didn't, although I had the uni experience I never really did the whole uni, uni thing. Um, so once I was a once I'd qualified as a teacher I Part of me thought, oh, all that working for three years at uni, and at the time it was just after I won that £20,000 development fund, I was struggling with my weight, things were getting on top of me a little bit, and I think I needed a break. Mm -hmm. And I was very lucky, I got offered a job at our local and which was it's six miles down the road, working with one of my best friends who I actually trained at uni, but university with. So I knew I was going into a very good department within the local school. And actually, it, it was an eye-opener and it was brilliant because it allowed me to come make that decision to come back into the spa that I loved. You're glad you did it now. You're glad that mum pushed you down that route. Yes, absolutely, because I think without having that break, I would never know. F I think if I'd stayed in race time, I would be in racing because I've always been in racing. Mm. But actually stepping away from it allowed me to go back into racing because I knew inside that's what I want in life. Uh, physically now, neck-wise, everything. I mean, you're, you're riding. I don't know. We've seen that. But were you? Are you? Are you limited now in, in any way, or, or you, you know, you consider yourself to have made a full recovery? Um, yes, I've, I've made a full recovery. Um, I probably have more aches and pains, and I'm not probably sure how it feels to not have a pain in your neck but I mean um, no it's fine I'm just grateful that I'm physically as fine as I am. I love the positivity <laughs> that's very much coming across. Um, Emma it's, it's great to meet you actually you're sticking around and uh, we've got our talking points coming up in points this week and uh, we'll also then have a chat with with all of us at the end. Maddie and Jim will be back in uh, shortly. Uh, it's time we got out to Corky Brown again.
I read somewhere that picking out a, a favourite horse of yours, I was almost surprised to, that, that you, you talked about My Tent or yours. He, he, he tried to win many champion hurdles but, but didn't. But what was it about My Tent that was so special? He's a really honest as hell, really honest as any horse in the world. I always give his best. I mean, you know, he was four, four times your second in Chelenham. Was he just bumping into better horses? Was it a track thing for him? What, what was I don't know. I, I don't know, but he just, whatever he ran down, even at Kempton, he, he was a good horse. Mm. You know, in the Christmas hall and that, he was a, he was a good lorry, he was a good horse. He was just unlucky to come up against one or two good ones. A lot of horses get, after so many battles, they gave up after. Every, every, every time he ran, he was a lucky horse. How hard was it to, to to walk away after all this time? Well, it was. It, it, I, you know, I, I took me it took me about four or five weeks to get in. After they go in there now, they go in and see him. And uh, forty-one years, like his lot. You know, we done everything together, but. Anything I didn't do, we didn't do it together. We didn't. <laughs> but all of the things we done, you know, we done everything together for 41 years. But it was hard to go in there, yeah. I, I knew it was going to be sad, especially with me anyway. And um, so I got up courage and waited till the governor was in and relaxed and at home because he's always rushing around busy. I went in him and saw people in the office. I, said, I never go in the office unless... When he sees me going into the office, somebody's got a problem, a big leg problem, because most of the things I could handle myself. But when I can't handle it, I go in and tell him beforehand. No, what's wrong? I said, nothing wrong, nothing wrong. Every time you come in here, I say, I know there's something wrong. We say, well, what is wrong? So nothing, absolutely nothing. This time of the year anyway, so it couldn't be much wrong. So what is it? So I just said, you know, I got a colour of the day, I think. I said, what? Well, you're packing up. So I'll do the same, he says. I said, don't be stupid. I said, you've got another 20 years. And he said, uh, serious? I said, yeah. Well, well, it's a sad time. But so he could, so he went into the house and got a bottle of scotch out. It was sad, yeah. Did you just know that it just felt like the right time? Because you were never going to do it if it didn't feel right, I suppose. It just, right. that was the right time. Well, I was, yeah, I just, 77. I thought, I'm going to see a bit of life now, am I? <laughs> a bit later, I'm looking, I'm looking for life. I was about 77 years of age. But yeah, I need to do something now. Go places with family now. The, it was a, it was a hard, hard, hard thing to walk in there and do. It must have been after, after such a long time. Because of what you know so well, mm. it's a, it, it'll, be, it'll be quite the change. But you'll still have enormous sub what comes out of here. You, know, you might be in every now and again. Like you said, you come in when you want. But you said, you like schooling, you like to you like see horses working. Why don't you come in those two mornings a week if nothing else? But he said, come in any day. The place is yours, for Christ's sake. Such good horses here. So did that, did that make it an easier easier time to, to move away, leaving leaving it in such rude health? Good health and good, good, you know, and good staff left here. You know, he's got... Three, two or three assistants, he got three or four band managers. Staff here. You probably usually 45 staff here every year. And, and he's got the horses anyway. He's still got the horses. As you know, we had two young horses this year. First of all, at Penton Hill. Mm. Two chopping all horses in the one yard again. Good as he, and he's good as each other. Um, so that looked forward to I'll tell the forward to again. All the horses again, they're good horses. I feel... Great, you have to leave behind me. So how, how's Corky going to relax? What's next for you? I don't know, everybody tell me I'd be all right. Well, I don't know. I need to keep busy, I need to keep doing something. Because out here, like, once you get out here, it's busy.
Mm. Not what'll happen to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you'll. Well, be... I like I like the, my game of golf, which I'm, at the moment I'm playing twice a week, so that's something. Twice a week, you're going to be a bandit before you know it, Corky. I hope <laughs> you will. But uh, yeah, I'm going to miss it. I'll probably when the big stuff comes out. Mm. When the new green came to stand down and ask God to come out and play big horses. Um, I wish I was there. I'll be, I'll be seeing, probably. Two of the great horses. The Racing TV website has all the exclusive racing content you love from our channel and so much more. RacingTV.com is a true one-stop shop for all racing fans, featuring the latest race cards, videos and all on one easy-to-use site. You'll never miss a race on RacingTV.com. Watch the main channel or create your own viewing experience by watching up to four of our dedicated live race course feeds at once on Racing TV Extra. Live, our race replays will be online within minutes of the finish. We know how important race cards are. That's why we've teamed up with Timeform to offer in-depth and easy-to-digest cards with Timeform ratings and odds comparison powered by Odds Check. Our fast result service from courses around the world will keep you up to date with all the latest racing results. If you rate a horse you've seen, you can add it to the industry-leading racing TV tracker. Then you'll be notified the next time it's entered for a race and due to run. Need to miss the price again. And there's more. RacingTV.com provides a daily tipping service from our betting experts, which are certainly worth looking out for. You can even apply for your next club day via RacingTV.com. Simply head to the... Select the club day you'd like to attend and you'll be on course before you know it. With these features and so much more, the Racing TV website is your ultimate online hub for horse racing. Start making the most of your membership now at RacingTV.com, mobile or tablet. At every moment on my journey, there has only been one focus. Winning. Winning. Last year was... And the line really roars today! But now the hunger grows inside. To win more. Door heart and the Tin Man has his day in the sun at Haydock. And more. And more. I look around at the champions. And champions to be. These will fight it out. And they inspire me. And they're on their way. To be a champion, you have to work harder than everyone else. They get through and have won. The hunger turning to fire. They're off. Tuning me to work harder. Racing up the way towards the line. Roaring on the near side. The line rolls a stand up. And to go. She's going to win the Kipco 1000 get it. To be disciplined. They're practically together now. They fight to the down. To be patient. As we now run inside the last furlong, he's finishing strongly. To be a champion. To be a champion. Tipco British Champion Series, showcasing the finest flat racing. Luck on Sunday. El Basti at Cruel, Dubai. Now welcome back to Racing TV this Sunday morning and indeed to Luck on Sunday. Still alongside me, Jim Boyle and Emma Sayer. We've said goodbye to a young Kieran Fallon. We're going to get stuck into our talking points now. We've got six points. We've got two minutes on each topic. You know how it works now. I hope the guests do. Let's get stuck into some talking points. It was the Shergar Cup this week, yesterday, and Jamie Carr, who was over uh, riding for the girls' team, Australian rider, jockeys, this was in an article in The Guardian, are given rough ride in backward Britain. The statistic that was floated here, three of the top six 
as far as winners go, uh, this is riders in Australia, are female jockeys. It's two in the top 50 in the UK. On what Jamie said about this being a, a backward uh, racing society in Britain, what's your take on it, given as somebody that, that's gone through the industry as a female rider? You know, I actually, I think the, the bottom line is, if, the, if you're good enough, if the talent is there, hard enough, the opportunities are there for the women riders. You, it's difficult, isn't it, to argue with the statistics put in front of you. I know, you know, Kevin Blake made an argument about it, you know, prize money is important as well, yes. But as far as those winners go, three in the top six in Australia, and we can only boast two in the top 50. They're quite striking statistics, Maddie. Yeah, you can't argue with it. And I think, um, you know, it's been really interesting hearing from Emma today about what she feels about opportunities for women. And we'll get on to the £3 allowance that's coming back. Does there need to be more of an incentive for, for trainers to use female riders? Maybe. How did you, Jim, as a, as a trainer, um, your, you, you've used Isabel, for, for example, Isabel Francis a great deal. But, but, I mean, did you have an opportunity, did you feel you had a number of different female riders, or is that not something that really comes into your consciousness? You see a rider, male or female, and you'll pick the rider that's best for the horse. 100%, but I mean, you know, Isabel's my apprentice. Um, before I had her, you know, Rian Ingram up the road. I was, I was, and, and you know, we use a lot of females as do as do many other trainers. Uh, look, I think when we go over to Australia, someone has to say something controversial and, and get things blown up. And I think Jamie's done the same over here. The statistics do, you know, lend to uh, 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 something that needs to needs to improve. And, and changing for the better and have done over time will continue to do so. You, Emma, very quickly, you, you never necessarily, and it's something we'll, we'll, we'll branch out on, but you never sort of you know, felt like a, a female rider in a man's world, per se. No, absolutely not. I think you need to be tough and you need to try and hold your... I think, you know, if you can do that, then you will get the success. There will be more on that, uh, but we've only got two minutes on that specific story. The allowance is something we're going to discuss. Do not worry about that. Hayley Turner, not from a female perspective necessarily, for she has very much flown that flag over the years. In the set, she had another couple of winners at the Shergar Cup. She's been an absolute stalwart in that. She's won the Alistair Haggis Silver Saddle uh, for the last two seasons now, but also riding the Ascot winner um, this season. The fact that She'd given up, Maddie. You know, doing ITV racing, and she wasn't running. She's come back, and I think when people did, there were a few that thought, "Can she? Can she really come back and get to the top of her game?" It's an absolutely phenomenal return story. Yeah, exactly. And aren't we lucky to have her? I think for me, and what we've discussed this morning, jockeys, you know, Emma Kieran's even touched on the pressure that jockeys put themselves under, and perhaps during that break, she really got back to herself and found out that racing was what she really wanted to do. And now I feel like she's taken a different approach, and she's focusing less left, right, and centre, and more on enjoying the experience of riding. And I think you can see that in in her, how she's performing. Did you? And feel free to say no, Emma. But did, you know, did, did you look up to Haley as a rider when you were coming through the ranks? Absolutely. I mean, Haley is riding at the top of her game for a long time and I think she is an inspiration to a lot of the young girls that are coming through and I think we need those role models out there that are going to encourage um, encourage young people to come through. And again aside from, from Hayley being the fact that she, she has come back um, we've had a lot of sort of stories recently you know Frankie is somebody that had thought about giving up these riders who are, who are riding still at the top of their game these headline riders we were used to seeing 10-15 years ago Jim and they are they are still to knock on the perch. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Haley's riding as well, if not better than ever, and she does seem to be riding with that sort of freedom and, and a little bit of a weightlift of, off her shoulder, really. So um, it's great to see. I wonder, I wonder what that... There is something, I think, mentally in it, isn't there? She does seem to be enjoying it so much. We've got the same with Frank in the saddle. Yeah, absolutely. I think if you can... <clears throat> come back and choose to do the sport because you are enjoying it you've got less of that pressure you're not proving yourself you're there to enjoy it you've already stepped back from it you know what stepping back's like so why not just ride ride and with great success as well 2020 fixture list is out and um, there's been some criticism from uh, a number of sides that the pga have come out and said look perhaps it's not enough of a reduction given the pressures that are on the staff the the, the jockey club with regard fixtures and they've lost a good deal of fixtures uh, based upon this reduction of, of 20 fixtures in total. First of all, Jim, I suppose it boils down to the question, it, it's being addressed, do we have too much racing? We're going to have 20 less fixtures next season. Is that a good thing in your mind? 
It's not a simple equation, is it? You know, it, uh, I think people think that having this as a, as a pot of money and you have less fixtures, there's going to be the same amount of money to divide around. You know, it's not the case. Each fixture is you know, levy generating and, and money generating. So you can't just slash fixtures more money and we're always complaining there's not enough money so we need to be a little bit careful um, but there's no doubt that a, a you know a, an ever bloating fixture list was becoming unsustainable for, for the participant so did, did you feel that specifically with with your yard I, I don't know perhaps you did did you feel there were there were pressures on your yard and, and your team because of the amount of racing, particularly going into evening racing and finish times, etc.? Yeah, of course. But I mean, you know, we need to make ends meet, and we need runners and winners to make ends meet. So it's you know you've got to balance up the argument. We 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 need things afloat at our level, and, and we need we need fixtures at that at that lower level, and you know we need a certain number of them. But um, you know we also need to bear in mind that, that the welfare of, of all the sports participants is important, and so um, it's a it's a fine balance to be made. And I think it will do, Maddie, is that I know we've only got 20 fewer fixtures, but we might see some more competitive races, perhaps handicap-wise, perhaps field sizes, and that can then have a, a positive impact on the levy, hopefully. But whether or not only 20 fewer will make a difference remains I to be seen. I think that's... Me and Jim discussed it as well. 20, is that really going to have that much of an impact? I'm not too sure. So it's not a, a huge drastic change, but you wouldn't expect it to be because obviously the amount of... Um, money that those fixtures are generating is something that can't just be thrown away. It was announced to Don Hot uh, has been retired to, to stud uh, and will stand at Dallam Hall off the back of his win in the Sussex and an injury sustained, a hairline fracture. He had surgery. I believe that's all gone well. And we look forward to seeing what he does beyond the race course. What he did on the race course, hugely exciting, but the two-year-old profile he had, where do, where do you stand on, on, on did he live up to, to that billing with that, that, the subsequent two Group 1 wins he's had? Or how are you left with Two Darn Hot's race course career? His last couple of performances have been, been extremely um, strong performances. I haven't actually followed his career right from the very start, so possibly one of the other two would be able to he, he, take on this. He, well, I mean, he was the highest rated juvenile since Frankel. When we get quotes on that coming around, we absolute champion, an absolute world beater. Um, he, he won a, a Sussex Stakes, he, he won over in France as well. But he just took a while to, Jim, to, to get to where I think plenty in the racing public and racing press hoped he would be. Um, it, I suppose it's a sign of how good a trainer to his, his very best. Or did he get back to his best? Um, yeah, I think the figures would show that he pretty much did get back to his best. Um, and I'm delighted he did have the chance to get there because it it was a bit like a bit of a damp squib those first two or three runs this season, and uh, you know, with with Howard Howard uh, Howard come through. But um, certainly those last two runs, I think, pretty much got him back to, to where he was. Whether he was the great superstar, you know, he, clearly he wasn't the next Frankel, yeah. um, and he had blotted his copybook. But at least he's he's going. Uh, that two-year-old career wasn't, wasn't just a flash in the pan. And it's going to be very exciting to see what he does at Stubb because you've got on, the, you know, with, with Dar A. Me and, and, and Lati Dar and so many Dar horses that have proved themselves over middle distances. Well, he couldn't quite do that, but with, with a bit of precocity that he might put into his offspring, very exciting with his career at Stud, Maddie. Yeah, exactly. Um, one thing that would be worth mentioning is there's been a lot of horses go to Stud recently who have had short-lived careers or mm. as two-year-olds. So again, there's a lot of fragility in his family. So I'm not sure if he'd be particularly popular with the, the breeders. Yeah, he. Yeah, they, they've had some great horses, but they've they've missed some some races. There's been a, a lot of hard luck with regard to to those horses. Now, this is a bookmaker responsibility. It's really in in response to the uh, BBC documentary, which which came out, which was. I thought a pretty arguing one side of a, a story, but but arguing it well enough that um, it was an individual who, who, who tried to go out and, and double his money in a certain amount of weeks, titled Can You Beat the Bookies? One thing, Jim, that really came out of it was where the responsibility lies for the percentage of the population an issue, and it was argued, I think, on the documentary that bookmakers don't do enough for the services they provide to then help those who fall foul of, of the gambling industry and have an issue. Where, where, to your mind, where, does, where should the responsibility lie? Do enough, should they do more? Um, yeah, there's probably no doubt, and I think they've recognised the fact that they, they probably should be doing more. Um, you know, there's, everyone needs to take a little bit of personal responsibility, but there's, there's no doubt that um, you know, the gambling industry does... Haven't got the, the the means to resist and 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 become you know addicted. Um, but it's like a lot of things. 
it was a bit of a bookie bashing program, and I felt it was slightly slightly one sided in that respect. Um, a lot of people gamble responsibly and derive a lot of enjoyment out of it, pleasure. Some will make money out of it. Most of them won't. 